Welcome everybody. I know there's a, it can be a very intense topic to even read the title of uh, just consulting something like that. But um, as someone who's been, who's been the creator of Unlearning Ashram, I want to say that what we'd be doing today is to strictly stick with the known as we explore the unknown. My name is Kaushik. And I am the creator of Unlearning Ashram, and my work has been primarily to learn to stay comfortable with the unknown and the unknown, holding both of them together. I've been facilitating for over 10 years now um, with diverse groups of people. The core of our work is in really learning to slow down and pay deep attention to life in terms of seeing what is this. What is my inner wisdom really wanting me to see about how I look at the quality of how I live my life, right? So <clears throat> we do this uh, through two means. One is uh, through embodied mindful presence work and then through facilitation as an applied form of mindful presence work. In fact, the tagline that we have added to Unlearning Ashram is that we are into resensitizing our humanity through facilitated spaces. That's what I'll be inviting all of us to do. Um, but today, given the topic is quite intense, and I would love for us to really delve that deep into it, and we have just a little over an hour. Um, I want to make sure that we move forward into the space, into the theme itself. And I want to welcome all of you with this very straightforward question of just a reflection at this moment as you're sitting here in this in this space. What are the various forms of death that you are experiencing right now? You could unmute and just mention it if in a line or two, or if you're feeling like using the chat window, please feel free to just write it out. Yeah. I just put up the question on like because I created a few slides because these questions would be on. Okay, what are the various forms of death that you are experiencing right now? Take a moment, whatever comes to your mind, there are no right or wrong answers. Could you just maybe put it on the text so others can read it as well? On the chat window. For those who have joined us right now, this is the first question we're beginning of kicking off the session with. What are the various forms of death that you feel that you're experiencing right now in this moment? You can see whatever comes up again. You can put it up on the chat window. While others are reflecting, I would invite you to continue to write what is coming up for you. If you really look at this session that's happening here right now, I know for a fact there are at least three other sessions that are going on within this reimagining education conference right now. And you and all of us have chosen to be here in this moment. It means that in some way, whether you look at it as a FOMO or JOMO, are you, are you familiar with these terms? The fear of missing out and the joy of missing out. Whatever form you're looking at it as, if you're not willing to let that leave your system, if you do not die to the possibility of, what if I were there? 
We cannot be here in the first place and vice versa for those who are there as well. Even if you must just listen to me, not agree with me, but just to truly listen to me. Can you do it with all the noise in your head? With all the different ideas, maybe you expected a different uh, question to start off with, maybe you expected an activity or a different kind of person to sit here, different way of talking, different number of people. You know, when we do these, um, any of any session that we facilitate, one of the initial invitations that I often share with participants and for myself as well, is to really slow down and check what are the expectations with which I arrive into a space. Because when I come with an expectation, it is essentially a form of saying, I would like this to happen to me. And the onus is on the space and the other stakeholders out there to create an experience for myself. And one of the key ways to shift that energy around is to move from a space of expectation to a space of intention. Say I came here wanting clarity about how I hold death in my life. And I attend a session with that kind of expectation. I'm going to be loaded throughout the session because I'm constantly comparing and seeing, am I getting this yet or not? I'm looking for something, right? But if I learn to drop that and ask myself, what can I do to receive this intention, to set this intention and see how do I set myself in a way? What can I do? What is in my power to experience this, to take my experience of death and my understanding of death to the next level? Then there is a whole new world of possibilities that, that emerge because there's a certain responsibility and ownership and also agency that is opening up within us, right? within each of us. And that goes the same way with the facilitators as well, whoever is the knowledge holder and sharer at that moment it is still very present to them. If I myself do not really uh, arrive here fully, then I'm probably not going to be fully present to what is it that I'm sharing, right? So can I, at this point, invite all of us to consciously set this as our intention? Can we consciously try and die to all the other sessions and all the other things in your life that may be happening, like, you know, I, I would I would really like to go grab a cup of tea and I really wanted it so badly. I'm still sitting here thinking, should I have planned it like five minutes earlier? And when I've been able to get that cup of tea sitting here, my throat would really love it, right? So can we really experientially, what it means for me to embody something is to really sit with this experience of attempting to do something and as part of the unlearning work, to really hit those walls. I would like right now to let go of that thought and be here. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. And if it's not, what is really happening in that space, right? And for me, that is where the embodiment of the work really starts because it's always easy to talk about being, you know, being fully present and arriving here. But let's do this as an experiment throughout the session, whatever time you're going to spend with me here. It's your choice. But as you're here, if, when you're here, if you're here, I would like you to see if I'm here, can I completely die to everything else that's around and within me and truly see if I can stay present to it? Because that is where the work of looking at death as a lens begins for us today, right? And this, this, these little shifts that we're talking about from expectations to intentions and, and many others is something that I'd like to call the alchemy of transformation, right? Because death in its foundation is transformation. We'll come to that later, but I'd like to set a reasonable way forward for us in the one hour. We will obviously not be mastering all the aspects of everything that's out there and within us about death in, uh, in theory and practice, but we try to see if we can start with by establishing some base here, right? Let's establish some basics. One is we were not going to be talking about clinical aspects of death now we'll be dealing with things like the afterlife and rituals in different cultural contexts. Nor are we going to do uh, activities like, you know, writing a in letter, imagining that you're going to die in, in very soon and seeing and going through all of that. All of that is valuable. But what I want us to do today for a, for a, for a change in this session is, can we look at death here in the now? 
can I tell you a story? Is everyone okay with the story? Yeah. Um, Nasruddin was a very known, known to be a very wise man. And he hardly spoke much about his wisdom, but people knew, right? Um, and a friend of, a very close friend, childhood friend of Nasruddin, Nasruddin used to uh, crib with him all the time about the purpose of life itself. What is the bloody point of anything? We're all going to die anyway, he used to say. And he became so dysfunctional and depressed that he barely did his duties for his family, for his work. His work was crashing. And his wife was really clueless as to how, what to do with this person. She called Nasruddin and said, please, he's your oldest friend. Our daughter's wedding is just around the corner and he has to invite several people and visit their homes. What would people think if they see him looking so depressed and so upset all the time? Please do something. You're the wise one. Nasruddin agreed to accompany his friend as he went around visiting his friends and inviting them for the wedding. Now, the next day they started together from the friend's home. And each time they would set out to meet someone in the village, Nasruddin will end up stepping out of the house, picking up his sandals and holding them in his hands as he walked with his friend, walked barefoot all the way to the next person's house. And then he would place the sandals very carefully outside the house, enter in, invite them, come back, pick up the sandals and keep walking with him barefoot. Now the friend observed this for a while. He tried to make sense of it, tried to explain it away in his head. But then after a while, he just couldn't make sense of it. And it he just had to know. So he said, okay, I can't for the love of my life understand what it is that you're doing. Why are you carrying your footwear everywhere if you're not going to wear it? Either wear it or don't carry it around like an unnecessary burden. You look ridiculous, he said. Nasruddin just shrugged and said, eh, what is the point of wearing footwear? We're going to take it off anyway when we reach the next house. And the friend got the message. This is how so many of us end up dragging ourselves through life, thinking about what's the point of it, you're going to die anyway. If you obsess, that is very interesting that way. You know? If you obsess too much about it and glorify it, you get, to, you get into a whole lot of other drama. At the same time, if you completely deny it, it doesn't matter because it's going to find you anyway. The footwear is valuable only because life is about what happens right now. And that's what I'm saying. Let us look at death right now. And that's a fantastic way to know life itself. But before we get into all of that, let's look at some basics about what we know about death itself, for sure, with absolute certainty. Shall we do that? And please feel free to interact in the chat box. If I feel, if you feel like I've missed out on something and you have a different uh, experience of it, I would always welcome that. There are a few windows I'm sort of juggling. So here and there, I might miss out on one or two things. If that happens, please let me know. You can put up your digital hands or just unmute and just let me know. I'm happy to connect with uh, what I've missed. Yeah. So let's start with the basics. Death happens to all of us. Are we all in agreement with that? Anyone planning to live forever? I would like to connect with you later on if you are. <laughs> Please let me know. <laughs> okay, all right. oh. So that happens to all of us. It's inevitable. That much is established. We don't know through our own experience 100% with 100% surety what is going to happen exactly after death. That much is also something we can agree upon. Through experience, you've never been there and know for sure what exactly happens after death. It's not because, simply by virtue of the fact that it's not happening. Yeah. So much. Are we? Are we good? Are we on the same page? Okay. It is definitely an unknown, right? It is one of the. It's the mother of all unknowns, and yet, it is the only known that we have. We don't know if we'll be alive tomorrow or not for, with 100% certainty. We don't know how things are going to go in after the session, during the session, 
I have no idea what's going to happen in the next moment. My power might go off, my system might crash, I might forget what the hell I'm doing here. But one thing is for sure that doesn't change at all is that debt is waiting for me somewhere or the other. And that's definitely going to happen. That's the only known, in fact. So the last thing is that somewhere, and I might be wrong, but it's true for me and most of the people I've spoken to, almost all of us have some stories about and around death. Is that also true? Only three things. That is definitely going to happen. We don't know for 100% with 100% experience and surety what's going to happen. And that we have definitely some stories about death. Are we good with this much? Because we're going to use this as the foundation for everything we're going to explore and we'll be coming back to this. Any, any discrepancies here, we'll have to address it right now. Okay. So shall we set this as the foundation basis no, to work from? Give me, give me a discrepancy. Um, so the second yeah. thing about you say about how we have never experienced it firsthand. Um, a lot of times people have experienced physical death and like actually dying and then coming back. And um, I have, so I feel like I do have some understanding of what it kind of looks like. Sure. I hear you. Thank you for sharing that, Maria. So when I'm talking about death, we're looking at at least the mainstream understanding of the definition that once you die, it's it's over. That is what, at least for me, defines death of anything for that matter, right? Something is dead means it's gone, right? But I hear you, there is a gray area there and it is definitely uh, something that we will be uh, acknowledging. But today, what we'll try to do is we'll work with not the specifics of uh, these grays for now, but to at least make sure we have a clear sense of the black and white for now. But the grays definitely do exist and I want to acknowledge them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. Let's start with a simple but important part. So today we're going to look at four, at least four different phases. Okay. The first phase is to set a foundation. Let's look at that step one is done. The second step we're going to do is founded on this very simple question. When you think of your death, not the death of others or the loved ones, we're also not talking about metaphorical death at this point. We'll talk about your death, your end, right? Your end of your life. When you talk about your death, what is it that you experience in your body right now? What kind of sensations? What kind of emotions? What are you experiencing right now? Just check in. There's no right or wrong answer. Just to connect with your body and just see what's present. We'll take a few more seconds to see, just observe and see what's great. The others. If you do send something, please feel free to write. It's very important that you travel with this. This is not like a class or session where you're just listening to inputs. If you're not traveling together with me and with all of us, then we are trying to explore what this is, uh, what this whole thing is about, right? So it involves us to like, put ourselves in there and move through this inquiry together. Right? So let's do a quick guided practice because rooting myself in the now often takes me to just a lopsided experience of what is happening within me right now, right? I don't know. I'll give you a very simple example. Have you spoken to someone uh, about how their experience was? Say someone watched a movie or went for a trip and came back. And when you ask them about how their trip was or how the movie was, how often have you heard them talk about the specifics and the facts and the details, the context? 
right? And it's important at that point because they are trying to take you through the whole experience. But interestingly, if you notice, even in regular conversations, say you and I are watching a movie together. And when I ask you, how's the movie for you? I would like you to experiment with this, with your friends, with your family. Uh, just pick a random person, just ask something that you both have experienced, right? One thing I've often noticed in my journey of working with a lot of people is that a significant chunk of sharing is about the fact of the matter. It's like, oh, I walked in, I turned to the left and I saw this big door and then I pushed through it and then I saw these beautiful chandeliers. Blah, 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 blah. Or it's about the thought process that are happening. When I saw this, this is what I thought. And when I experienced this, this is what I thought, right? But there are other aspects, facets also that are much more grounded and much more reliable in terms of checking into what is happening within me. That's a whole other body of work. We've done that in the last two RECs. There are recordings. You can share that later. But the idea is to get a holistic sense of what is present within me when I'm checking into something. So if I ask myself, if I get in touch with my depths, what all is happening in me? In order to balance that equation out, we'll do a simple process where you pay attention only to your body sensations as I take you through a few emotions. Right? We focus on not thoughts, not the facts of the context, but only on the emotion and the sensations in the body. Sensations in the body can be either hot, cold, tugging, pulling, pricking, throbbing. All of these are also sensations, right? If you were to get a general idea of if it's a sensation or not, it's either a language of pressure or temperature, usually. So pressure, pulling, throbbing, pricking, tugging, all of these are some form of pressure. Even pain is a sort of pressure. Or it's temperature-based. I feel cold, I feel warm, I feel like skin is burning, something else is happening. Something happening around that. There might be a few exceptions, but generally to give you a sense of whether you're staying with the sensations or not. So let's do this. See, wherever you're sitting, please sit comfortably with your uh, back comfortably straight. If you need a backrest, that's okay. But try not to rest your head back. All right. Try and keep your palms open and on your lap, facing upwards. Let's just see if you can close your eyes if you're wearing spectacles. Please try and remove them. Let's do this together. Take a slow, gentle inhalation through the nostril and fill your lungs. When your lungs are full of air, Breathe out slowly through the mouth and stretch the breath as slowly, as long as you can until your lungs are emptied out. Let's do it one more time. Slow, deep, gentle. Full inhalation through the nostril, and exhale through the mouth, slowly stretch it like a long rubber band, stretch it as far as you can go, and relax your body with the exhalation consciously. One more time. Inhale slowly, fill your lungs. And as you exhale, exhale fully, deeply, completely. And Relax your body consciously into the exhalation. Keep your eyes closed. Play some music in the background. And in case it's too overwhelming, it's okay, please let me know. I've kept it already, checked it once, but it's too much. Now just travel with me as I invite you to different parts of your lived experience, different moments in your life where you experience different emotions. I would like you to avoid major triggers. If you have a traumatic event or something like that that's coming up associated with that, try not to go into it and open it up right now, but pick another instance from your life. So let's see if we can start by connecting with one moment in your life where you were 
immensely happy. I would like you to go try and find that one memory, one moment. It can also be a thought about something that could happen, need not be in the past tense at all. But I want you to really engage with it, try and live it. And as you live it, as you go into the details of experiencing it, I would like you to see what is lighting up in your body. Keep your eyes closed and relax your body and try to move to a time, a memory or a thought where you can connect with your, one of your most, see what parts of your body are lighting up. Just stay with that. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to interpret it. Don't try to change it. Just stay with that. Now journey with me into another memory. When you felt incredibly frustrated or angry, something or someone set you off. Just thinking about it right now makes your blood boil. It could be something that you experienced in your personal life, something that happened to somebody else, something that's happening out in the world where it generates extreme anger inside of you. See what other sensations are lighting up. In your mind, see if you can describe that sensation. In your own mind, see if you can describe that sensation. What kind of a sensation is it? Which part of your body is it happening? Is it stationary? Is it moving? Let's try and move to a space, another memory in our life where you were awestruck with beauty or gratitude. So much beauty that you experienced. See if you can just close your eyes and travel to that moment in your life or a thought where you're experiencing enormous beauty or immense gratitude. Okay. Just notice what is changing in the sensations that you're feeling in your body. Yeah. Let's do a couple of more emotions. See if you can go to a space of sadness. See how that feels in your body. What are the parts of your body that are lighting up? See if you can describe these sensations. Can you be absolutely with these sensations as you're hitting that memory? Can we move to a space of further intensity? Can you go into a space of fear? Once again, a reminder not to pick up those memories that can be a traumatic trigger. But within your limits, pick something that truly makes you afraid, that you truly fear in life. It could be about somebody else, something out there, or for yourself. I would like you to just 
travel to that memory or that thought and engage with it and see what's happening in your body as you connect with it. Now we'll slowly move from that space of fear into a space of love and safety. Think about one moment when you felt extremely loved and safe, extremely held and protected, or someone or a moment or a space. It could be anything that you associate with love and safety and warmth and comfort. Just notice this change and shift in the sensations that are happening in your body. Now slowly bring your attention back to your breaths. Just your breath and my voice and see if you can take a slow, deep inhalation through your nostril once more, fill your lungs and exhale through the mouth, slowly relaxing your body, relaxing your emotions, just getting everything out, just ease your body. We do it one more time if it's needed. Inhale, slowly, gently, fully through the nostril. Exhale, slowly stretch it as you exhale through the mouth and relax into the exhalation. Let your body ease. Let it all out. Don't let anything stay inside of you. Feel free to do it once more. And when you feel ready, slowly. Gently open your eyes. Take your own time. Don't be in a hurry. Whenever you're feeling ready, gently slowly come back. I want to invite everyone to just check with your body. If you feel there is still some remnant of the process that you went through is still present in your body, just maybe comfort your body with touch, a rub to the shoulder or the chest, usually helps for me, or the stomach. You can also stretch your body as it's needed. Take deep breaths. You can also shake it out. Yeah. Meanwhile, those of you who feel like it, you just share what was it that you experienced at different points? What was it that you sensed in your body at different points? Maybe one or two quick instances you can share. We can take about two or three sharings before we move on. You can unmute and speak if you want to share briefly, or you can also put it on the chat box. Anyone wishes to share? I think I'm sorry, I was joining late, but just now um, joining and I was really like a little bit surprised how much shifted just when I changed the thought that when I was sensing into what's going on with this sort of fear, anxiety, it was like a a kind of holding tension in my body, like a, a like a closing kind of energy. And when I thought back to memory of like wholeness, it's like this other energy kind of 
moved through my body and I felt so much better. And it was, it was remarkable to me how just changing the thought led to this different kind of energetic experience. Thank you so much for sharing. Beautiful to hear. So please share in the chat as well. Anyone else, if you feel like sharing, please feel free to drop it in the chat. We'll move on. So um, this is a very interesting part of death itself for me because in the yogic tradition, one of the um, things that's talked about at the end of your life when you talk about shedding your body, being born as a human being is considered a gift because you have an active mind. Like we used your mind as the reins to move your emotions and your body. What happens when your body drops is that you also drop this faculty, right? You don't carry your brain, your memories and all of that. It's not in your conscious control. So <clears throat> I promise I won't talk about what happens after death. But just to give you a tidbit bit of insight about what the yogic system talks about, the importance of what we're doing, is that right now there is an opportunity for us to take charge of what is happening in this system in all aspects, with our body, with our thoughts, with our emotions, with our energies, with our breaths, irrespective of what theories you believe in or not, or what schools of thought, you know, practice you come from, these are common systems across cultures, is it not? Is it, it's common for you and me. So we're really looking at when we are exploring a question around death and we're asking, when I connect to myself and my own death and demise, permanent demise is what I want. I know that death is for me the end. That's at least the idea that I was told right as a kid. So when I think of it that way, what are some of the sensations that it's bringing in my system? I just want you to try once again, those of you who tried before and now just see if you can sense anything differently. And you already know what to relax and release that afterwards. But for now, just see if you can get in touch with it. See what sensations are coming up. What emotion does the sensation connect most with for you? If you check the patterns of your sensations, what is it similar to from what you just explored? Any emotion that comes to mind that is, is there's a similar pattern? I'm not looking for uh, the right answer, but anything that's present for you, you can share. You put it on the uh, chat, that way we can just, others can also see it, even if they're stepping in and out. So one of the common experiences around death, at least in general public opinion, if you see, is this evocation of fear. Right. Fundamentally, when you don't understand something or when it's so much unknown, this is the mother of all unknowns, as we saw, fear is a very strong construct. I want you to quickly see and off the top of your head, what are the fears around death? What are the fears? If you can pinpoint those, can you name those fears? Maybe like in what is the heart of that fear? I love what Devin's written already that the idea that I disappear at some point brings fear and anxiety. Yeah. There are emotions of anxiety, fear, charges shared. What is this fear? What are you afraid of? What, at least if you're feeling fear around this, what, what are some of the fears, if you can name those fears, like we name those emotions, uh, the sensation, I would describe them. What would those be? Responsibility is left incomplete, fear of physical pain, fantastic. The beauty and amazement part lights up. Fear of leaving too soon. Business yet to be done. Right? Okay. 
So let me just share. This is not like I've uh, tried to do some kind of uh, mentalism work, but it's very interesting to see the patterns. So for me, with all of what I have self-reflected over the years, it comes down to these four aspects. One is the fear of experiencing the process of the final demise itself for some people. I'm not saying this is applicable for everyone in every context, but I'm saying predominantly these narratives have come up for me. There, will there be suffocation? Will there be pain? Will there be struggle? Will I go through intense suffering? That is definitely a fear that happens. It's very true for me. And the other is a social concept, which is about if I move, if I go away and will others move on, will I no longer be as significant and relevant to the loved ones or people or the world or in my own life? Will the story just keep continuing? Because somehow in my move, in my story, in my understanding, in my view, I'm the hero of my story. I'm the protagonist. If I'm gone, the movie should end, but the damn movie is going on. How is this okay? So the sense of insignificance itself is a very strong fear. But more importantly, there are two other very interesting ones that have also come up. The known experiences of pleasantness, right? I have had this wonderful meal I would like to have. I will never be able to eat ice creams again, or I will never be able to, you know, hold my lover in my arms again, or my child, I will never be able to hug and kiss again. We've experienced different forms of pleasantness, some form of pleasantness, beauty, surprise, love, affection, joy. Nobody would say, oh, I don't want to die because I've never been stung by a king cobra. I want to experience it. No, not most people would. Some people would. Because for them, it's still a thriller. There's still some form of pleasantness that's happening there, right? You don't look forward to suffering in that sense. At least no, I don't. So there's a known form of pleasantness. And of course, Leaving too soon is a very classic example of possible pleasantness. I've never traveled to Africa. I would love to see Africa. I'll die too soon. But I've always wanted to know what it feels like to eat this, to be there, to do this, to experience this, which I don't have in my experience. But I would like it. If you really go deeply into it, three and four are not very different. Because a possibility of pleasantness is only attractive because I can connect it with something I've already experienced. Somebody tells me, if you go to Japan and try that dish, you think your Maggi noodles is as popular, is, uh, is so cool, it's 50 times better than that. And I feel like, oh, so this is my experience of pleasantness, and it's 50 times better than that, so I want to go there, right? It's always in relative comparative terms that I look forward to something. Without the past, there is no language for the future at least the anxiety of the future, or at least the expectation for the future, both of which we said we wanted to put to rest, put them, let them rest in peace, at least for the session. So it's very interesting that if you're here and worrying about, oh, what have I missed out there? What is still happening? Is the session going to go anywhere? What's happening? Is this really what I want to do? Then is that really about the future or is it about the past? That's the question I want to leave you with. But I'm not going to dig into this and go into too much theory for now. I have a very important question. If these four aspects, pain, fear of pain, fear of becoming insignificant, fear of losing known pleasures, losing possible pleasures, are at the foundation of this fear of death. Yeah. I want to ask, have these fears not played out right now as you're living? Have you not had a fear of pain, physical, emotional, mental, in your day-to-day -day life? Of becoming insignificant, you might go back to your school and see that the whole place has changed. There's hardly a soul that you remember. I go back to my school and one of the significant features was this large tree under which over a thousand kids used to sit and have lunch. That tree must, must have been like three, three to three years old. And I walked in recently and the tree was just gone because it had dried out and they had no other choice to remove it. It just felt like my childhood slipped out from my heart. I didn't know anybody who was there. I, there was the last 
the the new joinees of my time were just exiting, retiring that year. There was like two or three teachers I recognized. It felt like the school had just moved on. Kaushik was not needed anymore. I was the star pupil student. I was the uh, school pupil leader and all of that stuff that I put my heart and soul into every year, trying to be on top and showcase. What, what did it all come down to? Nobody remembers me. What about the past and the future? I'm bringing this up not to discomfort you, but to disrupt the ideas around death that we are having. Because how do it's important we understand how we deal with these fears today as, as we are alive in our everyday life. How we deal with these fears today will determine how you will deal with them and how you will deal with death tomorrow. That's a very interesting bridge. I don't want to make it as a definitive statement, but I would like you to inquire into it in the coming days. Let it stay as a seat and see what happens. There's one more thing, but I'll get to it in the next segment we're going to. The interesting thing is that not only will how we live today affect how we die tomorrow, not only does the living affect the life affects death, but how we hold death also affects our life today. That's going to be the next part we're going to look at. But I'll give you a few seconds. Just stay with this question of how are you holding these fears in your life right now. Stay with it for a few seconds, and then we'll go to the next one. All right, ready to move ahead. I know it's gotten, are you sensing all these sensations happening here? If so, it's good, I would say, because there's some churning happening. If not, that's okay too. Your seed is in storage. You'll plant it someday. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so the next phase is all about storytelling. And I'm going to start, kick started with this very interesting question, which is, what is the one of the most fanciful questions that I have been ever asked whenever I talk about, I mentioned about death. What do you believe will happen after you die? What is going to happen to you after you die? If you've had experiences, like Maria was quoting, if you've been, you believe in something, forget what you've been taught, but right now as you ask this question, what do you believe in? about what will happen. I want you to try and summarize that in two lines because it will help you get to the heart of it and try and write that right now in the chat before you lose it. Take a moment and as you're doing this, I would love to invite you to watch the sensations that are happening in your, in your body. It's very important to know what is what you're presenting. Are you doing it as just an intellectual exercise or are you really connecting with that question your body will tell. Make sure who is in the room, see if you can write those two lines about what you believe in. If this is about you confronting your beliefs right now, your truth right now. Don't worry about what others would think. Is this right or wrong? There's no such thing, at least for this activity. Whatever you write right now is what is present for you right now. In next five minutes, you change your story completely. I'm perfectly okay with that. So don't worry, you tied up with this answer as well. Yeah. What's present in our life for you like? Right? 
Shall I stop the screen sharing? I will see the faces. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I didn't see all the chat responses. Okay. Wonderful. I'm not going to read the responses. <laughs> I leave that up to you to read the responses that are there. And if any of you have just joined, I think a couple of people have joined. In. Please check. The question that we are checking into is what do you believe will happen when you die after your death? See if you can summarize that in two lines. See if you can really connect with it and just try it. Yeah. Okay. So, one thing I would like to do is to, I won't call it being me, but I'm going to be, I'm going to burst a little bubble before we go forward. For some of them, maybe not all. Okay. The question was defined as, what is it that you believe will happen to you after your death? And I genuinely, wholeheartedly respect every, each and every one of our beliefs because it comes from, we come from different backgrounds, different cultures. And I think there's a fascinating and rich history of communities and cultures who have addressed death and talked about what will happen and how it uh, how it impacts the person who is going on a journey. And I think there's a significance to that that we will come back later. But for now, coming back to the original intention of this session that we set out to do in the beginning is to stay with what is death here right now for me. And as part of that, if you really want to inquire into this together for this period, what should we let die? The ideas of the known. Yeah. So you can inquire without that bias. But to let that go, one simple thing I've noticed for myself is that the moment I say I believe something, belief by its very definition means that it's a, it's something that I've come to terms with because I don't know. Yeah. How many fingers in your hands right now? Can you count? One hand? Four, five, six, whatever is your number. Yeah. But do you believe you have these many number of fingers or do you know you have these many fingers? Sorry, a little bit of semantics, I know. It's not about, it's not an English class, but a little bit. It's important because language reflects how we hold something inside of us, how we perceive also, right? So only to that extent we'll go in. Relief by definition is something that I don't know. So it's not wrong or right about, I'm not trying to make it a moral question of whether to hold beliefs or not, which is the right belief or not. I'm not going into that at all. And I have no commentary to make. But one thing is for sure, like we set out those fundamentals in the beginning before we started, death is going to happen for everyone. What are the three things we looked at? Anyone remembers? Should I do a revision? That happens to all of us. Experientially, almost all of us. I know uh, you had one exception here, here, but none of us have ended our life. At least experientially to know what's on the other side, personally. And we all have some stories about death. So we come to the stories part now. Okay? And these stories can be phenomenally empowering. They can drive you nuts, but they're stories. And it's important to remember that because right now it's a belief, right? And we're not saying it's wrong or right. I want to make that very clear because I feel like people sometimes think that I'm after their belief. I am not. we be very, very clear. But it's important to investigate. We need to really understand the difference. So if you look at the primary largely the stories that have happened around death in the world. Today is a day of fours. You know? There are four phases, four parts to the session. We went into the four different kinds of uh, fears that happened. So we split to four, four major story types that happened, archetypes that happened around death, stories around death. 
But interestingly, this time I'm going to lighten it up a little bit. I know we're getting to the second half and towards the tail end. I don't want to squeeze you up inside. So let's try it a little differently. Tell me what you understand from this. I put up all the four types of stories across the world that I have seen around death. I've represented them geometrically. Oh my God. Okay. Anything you'd like to mention in the chat? So the first one looks like it starts like this and then splits into two and then there's a dot 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 happening on either side. The next one is a symbol of what is popularly infinity or a circle. The other one is a short line segment and the other one is a spiral, right? I'd like to call them for the sake of also easing up things. The first one is called YOLO and the fork in the road. This is mostly the stories of the Abrahamic religions. You have one shot at life, but at the end, you have a fork. If you did reasonably, relatively well, you go up. If you did reasonably poorly, you go down. But you keep going on forever, which is why the starting point is too small, because life is just a short thing. It's supposed to be eternal damnation, eternal heaven. It keeps on going, right? On and on and on. So that's one story. You live only once, but there is definitely a fork in the road. You'll have to take that. Right? There's no, maybe this also and that also. It's like choosing today's session. You came here, you missed others. So what to do is like choose this. All right. So the second one, I'd like to call the loopity loop, 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 loop. You know how it goes, the loops. This is the story of most of the Eastern religions and belief systems. There are only two major epicenters for religions, at least that are existent today. Major. There are several subsects as well. But the second story of what some people call is Indic regions, uh, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, all of these is to understand that life happens in a cycle. So there's birth and rebirth and birth and rebirth and birth and rebirth, but it happens in a loop. It keeps going on and on and on and on and on, right? And you can either visualize it as a circle or an infinity because it's a Mobius strip. It keeps going on and on. You keep like, you, you feel like you're getting somewhere or oh, next birth, next birth, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but you're still stuck in the loop, right? It keeps going on and on. The third one is the story of materialists in the Indic traditions that are called the Charvakas because it's 6,000, 7,000 years old. We had uh, disbelievers and atheists and you know Charvakas in, in this country. We were recognized and put as an Indic philosophical sect. Okay, They believe what is, is, that's all. What you can sense and see, that is it. So what is material exists? When you die, everything shuts off. The computer switched off. End of story. Nothing more, nothing less. Right? So it starts, it ends, there's a straight line over. So what becomes important is that you live today, right now, but nothing later on. No fork in the road, nothing else. Okay. The fourth, most important is, oh yeah, the third one I like to call it, this is it. And then I googled it up and I saw it first thing that came up was Michael Jackson's story. So I wanted to make sure that's not what we're making fun of. The fourth one is, please let this be it. This is the story of all the spiritual groups, mostly across the world. They recognize that there is a there is everything exists is together. Everything impacts everything else. And everything is going in cycles. But they also recognize that that loop and that cycle is a trap. They want this to be the end, go back to the source, end the story, and stop building more births. That's the story of Nirvana. That's the story of Enlightenment, that's the story of moksha, mukti, whatever word you use in whatever culture you're from. Yeah, these are four different aspects. I know we're running short of time. So this was originally a one minute, 12, a one hour, 15 minute session. So I might stretch by like five minutes, but I'll let you go 10 minutes before the next session for you to relax and rest. And we won't keep it very intense. So for those of you who would like to stay, please hang on because I want to bring it full circle. And I think it will be unfair and unjust to just leave it hanging just like that. Okay. So the story of how we hold death reflects in so many ways in how we build systems around us. For example, you look at the education system, at least the one I grew up in, you have to either take the science path or you have to take the commerce path or you have to take 
this path or that path, it's always existing in folks. You do not get to choose both unless you're really, really privileged and fortunate or very clever, right? So the setup and the larger design, and I want to say this upfront before I even put this across, this is not a, a hard and fast rule about a commentary about all these systems. I'm talking about predominantly the large mainstream narratives of how most of these systems are. There are always exceptions. The very fact we are doing this REC here is because we are reimagining the education system. We are, we're always, there's always hope to do things differently, right? But we're talking about how most of the systems are tentatively designed, at least for the larger population out there. If you look at the judicial system, by design, it has to be a yes or no. You can't say partially guilty. It has to be a guilty, guilty or non-guilty verdict, right? It has to take a fork in the road. The political systems I wrote as a, a satire because most of the political systems across the globe is bipartisan. So <laughs> including my state, my country, I think the US and so many other countries, you feel like you have choices, but there are only two. Right? You go, I'm not talking one is heaven, one is hell, but I'm saying there are these two. I don't make that connection. <laughs> okay. And other places like workspaces and law enforcement, where they have to keep making these judgments. It's either this or that. You have to make that that call. And it's very important that you need to make that call. But the design of the system, sometimes it's needed by design to have it like this. Sometimes what would be different, like the education system, or the political system, we end up creating based on this story that is unconsciously affecting us. Similarly, with the cyclical systems, you see most of sustainable farming, natural-based, nature-based systems. Even the mental health system I put in there because I've been noticing as a mental health practitioner myself, uh, professional myself, I'm noticing that the systems that you're building in the mainstream sort of builds this tentative you know, dependency with clients. You need to keep going back to your therapist or go back to those drugs to keep staying stable. It builds a redundancy within itself. Not that it's right or wrong, but it's by design that way, right? And when you look at how we build communities, tribes, or friendships, we would like it to keep going, perpetuating. If somebody says, I'll be your friend for six months, and then later we'll part ways, not usually what I would go for, right? I want it to be till forever and forever. And of course, in India, we say for seven births, for 10 births, we would like to be together. <laughs> That's how we talk. Uh, so the third one, the short and crisp aspects, you'll see capitalism, how we treat the environment, development, at any cost, don't give a damn about who's coming next. I want to live. I want to make sure that it's done. I want to use everything up. I'm going to finish and throw my trash like this because I don't care. I'm going to be here for a short time and no consequences for anything. I'm happy. Pleasure becomes an important focus of this path. So most of these transactions, most of these sometimes even toxic and manipulative spaces become like this because I just want to use and throw. Right? But at the same time, you see, uh, it also had other roles, like when you go for experience hopping, you know, you want to go absorb something from somebody, that's it. You don't want to build a connection with them, stay for too long. Even in the yogic traditions that have been gurus who have been like that. You come, use me, learn from me and leave. Don't really create a long-term relationship. I The knowledge stays inside, right? The, 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 the moment of connection, it's very small. Traditional marriages, which are supposed to be unto death, that's the oaths that some of you take, no? Until death do us part. That's it. Not no, not seven births a month. No, that's not happening in the West. At least, <laughs> so it's a short agreement. Like it's a it's a very clear agreement that's happening there. In fact, I think the U.S. marriage is seen as a contractual agreement itself. That's why the unemployment and all is there. Is what I've heard. But anyway, the last spiral is I changed the spiral a little bit here because there are two points. You can see it either way, as you expanding and then merging into the source, or you becoming nothing and going into the center. Both of it works. Most of the spiritual movements are talking about this. Social change movements. Interesting, people see it as left wing, right wing, and all this thing, but I, I see both of them like this. Nobody wants change for just six months. I want patriarchy to go. I want sexism to just die. And I want to be lived in such a way that it just leaves, it merges back, it goes away, right? And it does not just die. I can't just throw a bomb at it. It needs to evolve. It needs to, people need to wake up and it needs to go out of context. It needs to go through a spiral of evolution and then dissipate into nothingness. And that's the nature of the system that we build. Even intimate relationships. If you're not looking to grow with somebody, there's no commitment. Right? It's just a mixed match story. So most of the transformation work, healing work, all of this that we are seeing is based on these kind of models. These are unconsciously present. So my question that I want to leave you with today is, 
what are the stories that you let shape your life and your world view? Because how you see the world and what systems that you subscribe to, she definitely is impacted. I have seen it at least personally. In my truth, it is that the, the, the reason my parents chose uh, that I had to study somewhere and live a certain way is because of how they hold their ideas of moral righteousness, social righteousness, conformity, but all of it will somehow connect if you really look at it. Fundamentally, it will go back to how they hold what they think is right and that goes back to their belief systems. Belief systems, on the top of that, there's a crown of the belief system is your story of death. I know this is a bit straightforward and a lot to take, but I'm just leaving it there to simmer so you can take your own time to see what is the way, what these patterns mean for you as you go ahead. I'm just going to do a last part very shortly, which is tying all of this up to unlearning. Right? If you really want to use death as a living lens of life to experience unlearning, what is it that we really, really need to do? I'll stop the thing, screen share is the last. I will just give you 10 seconds to just stretch, ease up, then we just finish this in the next five minutes. And then we can wrap up after like a quick five more minutes of insights and sharing from you guys. Yeah? So when it comes to dying, In the spiritual traditions, one of the most important things is to die consciously, right? If you want to break from the cycle of birth and rebirth, the spiral loop, that's maybe one of the clans that I'm from. Uh, the key practice is to just learn to die right, die properly, die well. In fact, some schools talk about spending your entire life in practice in sadhana, so you sleep, uh, you die consciously at the end of your life, right? There are stories of spiritual monks and yogis who have spent their entire life in sadhana. Last minute, they get into some emotional turmoil or get entangled with life and they come back again. Right? So there is a huge significant place on dying consciously. And that's what I'm going to bring it all back into. Because dying consciously one beautiful litmus test maybe that's helpful for you to experiment in your life and see in that yoga shares about is just watching how you enter sleep. Mm -hmm. If you can be aware in the transition from your wakefulness to sleep consistently and effortlessly over time, that means you're in the right direction. Your spiritual work is progressing in the right direction. That's one of the indicators, not the only one. Don't hold me account. Okay, so this is a very strong and very significant way people check what's happening. So, see, um, let me put it this way very simply to, to summarize. The science and art of dying is a universal knowledge itself. We're not going to go into all of that in the time that we have. But going back to this foundation that we built, we know that death is inevitable. We're all walking towards it anyway. Right. In fact, you can think of it like this: when you're more, when you're born, your your time has started. Only thing is, it's going to complete by the end of your life. That's it. So, it's happening at all times in your body. I don't know how old uh, the average age is here, but in our bodies, most cells are replaced every sixty days, ninety days. I don't know if you've heard of this concept of Theseus' ship, where every part of the ship is replaced with a new boat, new ship. And then in the end, all the parts have been replaced with another boat. So all the old parts have gone to another ship and then the, all the new parts have come to this ship. Now, which is Theseus' ship? No, is this even that? It doesn't even retain the identity anymore. So in your body, you were a baby like this years ago. Now you've grown this much. Maybe you'll shrink a little, then wither away. There's death happening in our bodies, death happening in every breath. There's death happening of every thought, every idea, Every emotion, every connection, every ideology, every relationship that you've held, it's happening all the time. <laughs> the only choice and the wisest choice that we have is if this death we can conduct 
consciously or unconsciously. That's all there is, right? If you are towards the path of conducting your death consciously, then you are an unlearner. That's how I look at unlearning for myself. Because this involves paying enormous attention to life. It involves confronting the stories that we have about death and seeing how it impacts our life. It involves transcending these stories to look at life just as it is with openness, with curiosity, with deep attention and with a lot of sensitivity to what is present right now. If you're able to do this, you'll see in small and significant ways, death is becoming more and more of a conscious process in every moment. That means the so-called, when you're here, you're fully here. You're fully alive here because your awareness is dead to all the things that about the past and the future and about pain and about insignificance. All these fears are dead because you're absolutely present. You fully arrive here and that is true mindful presence. It's easy to say I'm fully here, I'm present here. But true mindful presence is about making watching and witnessing a way of life. To such a person, pain and insignificance is no longer a fear. It just goes. And it just liberates you from this sorrow of time. That's the most beautiful poetic, poetic phrase I've ever come across. Time is sorrow because your, your past and your future, which are one and the same in some ways, is most of what people are struggling in their mental state. So I'll just end with this few lines. In becoming watchful, you liberate yourself to the burden of time itself. In liberating yourself from the burden of time, you become truly present. In becoming truly present, you have learned to die consciously to what is not in you. And in learning to die consciously, you have truly embodied unlearning as a conscious process. I'm going to let that sink in. And I am done for my end. Thank you so much for stretching and staying here. You can just hear a couple of quick reflections if anyone wants to share, or you can put it on the chat. Or if you have any questions, we can simply take them. We'll spend another two to three minutes, and then we can wrap up with 12 minutes to the next session. That work? I finished right on time. <laughs> Thank you. I asked for one hour and 15 minutes. So, yeah, you're on time. Any reflections, any sharing? I know it might be a lot of things to process, but whatever it is that you're present to right now, whatever is turning, not as a form of me answering anything, but just to put it out there. If you want to give it voice, please unmute and share. We'd love to hear um, your voice. I hello. I, I want to share my story. Um, so when I was meditating, after meditation, I there were four four lines came out. It was a poem in Vietnamese. And I, I would just read a bit Vietnamese version and then I'll translate to English. Um Lá rồi cây, cây chẳng giữ. Lá chạp đất, đất chạp từ. It means that when the leaves, it leaves the branch. The the brand doesn't keep it, doesn't hold it. And when the leaf touch the soil, the soil doesn't turn away. So uh, from that, I learned that it, it is a very natural uh, process and it's not uh, just ending. And I think a lot of suffering comes from that we hold, that we, 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 we think that oh, it is ending and there's no more. But from that really beautiful poem that I received from the meditation, I learned that it's just, natural and it is natural for us to to know to let go and we know how to do it so yeah that that's just what i want to share thank you so much it was so beautiful i'm still staying with that um if you can maybe share a translation of that with uh, on the chat if you have a ready, i would love to listen to it. thank you so much Good. Anyone else? Quick reflections, sharing, questions. Questions are just to just stay, okay? I'm not going to answer it. Anish, I hear your question. Um, yeah, 
uh, I think we'll come to, I think one of the key con words I connect with unlearning is aliveness. Mm -hmm. And because there is no standard definition of what it means to be alive. What for me it means is how alive can I be in this moment? And sometimes there are various situations I feel dull down, pulled down. But I do the best that I can do in that moment to keep myself vibrantly alive. And no matter where you are, that my at least my school of uh, yoga where they teach me that one of the things that they say is as long as you're breathing, there's possible. Because breath work is at the foundation of it. So maybe not this much, maybe this much, maybe it's not this much. This much. Mm -hmm. But it's you're moving in the direction of aliveness. And I think that is what truly really matters as a quality when you're talking about army. So thank you for sharing. I was not part of the conversation and trying to get a feel of it. But you said the word yoga, and then there is the Shiv Tattva, which is that the bliss of nothingness. And then there is the Vishnu Tattva of trying to be completely involved with everything in such ways that you see it ripple in the future and the past and what needs to be done now. And then there is that point of creation that you want to bring something new in the world. How do you unify all of that with your work? Or is that even... Yeah, that's it. You asked me about my work. I would say I've learned it. Uh, I learned it the hard way, I would say. That there are two kinds of approaches to life. One is to have a framework of logic where I try to fit the work reality into it. Like, why is life not happening my way? Is the fundamental source of misery I've seen across humanity in myself as well. And I realized the smarter, wiser, and simpler thing to do is to break that framework and just surrender to the way life works, whatever it is, to whatever lens you're seeing it as. And uh, aligning myself to that means I I come to terms with the fact that I don't know. I might never know. I might never be able to grasp all of that in my work. I want to just, right now in this moment, what I'm holding, how am I holding it? And how can I be with it fully? That's all that work. And whatever comes out of that, I think there's a larger intelligence that's take care, whatever form it is. Yes, Dad. I just wanted to share this image that's helpful for me recently. And I think I'm... I, I'm feeling it more now. It's not. It's less of an idea, and, and it's resonating for me more. This idea of like, instead of thinking I am this individual person, if I let go of this identification, things can start to move a bit differently. And I, I think, it's almost like we are cells of the Earth's body, but if the cells in our body start to think they exist and they're gonna die, then they start acting out and doing all kinds of things that they're not. That's not really their function. And if I have a story like, what am I supposed to do? What is that person doing? It's like a cell trying to look to another part of the body and figure out what am I supposed to do? But we cannot, it's not something we can know because the intelligence of the cell, it is only works when it's through a larger intelligence of the body. So I can't know exactly what I'm supposed to do or how I'm supposed to live, all these things. But if I surrender and know that when I let go of this attachment to myself as a body that's gonna die and realize I'm part of this movement, <coughs> much bigger than my reality or my life, then I can be moved in a way that's generative as opposed to holding on in a way that's, you know, destructive. Thank you for sharing that. I think I just mentioned this quickly. Uh, for me personally, I've come to see that this is a dance between two energies, right? One of survival and one of thriving. There was a primal brain aspect to it and then there is a prefrontal cortex that supposedly makes us the most uh, sophisticated uh, creatures on the planet. But in our daily lives, there is a push between survival instinct and thriving instinct that keeps moving back and forth. When I'm in a moment of survival, none of this makes sense. The identity is important because this is what I'm trying to protect, right? My family, my life. If you go down to the, uh, the kind of grassroots work that I do, I can never sit them down and talk about death. They just laugh at my face because they're, they're struggling for the next meal, right? And they're constantly facing oppression. Everyone is in some way. That's also true. But such a strong survival instinct process in their daily life that there is no space for all of this to thrive. And yet, in our own context, 
to know where to keep the survival process to what bare minimum it's needed. If you can learn the art of keeping it there, because when I'm sitting and listening here, if I feel threatened by everybody's viewpoint, that's a survival process that's unnecessary. It's counterintuitive to my own, counterproductive to my own growth. So learning to know when to switch it on and off also comes from observing what's happening inside of me, what's happening in the body, what's happening in the emotion. So I think what we're really looking at is the tool of knowing that it's like this little lamp. If you know how to hold this lamp safely, wherever you go, you'll see a few, few feet ahead of you. That will illuminate somehow. That is the hope that I that we're trying to build with this, this uh, whole work that I know what's happening to me right now. This moment is something I want to embrace fully. And wherever that leads, uh, we'll hopefully find more clarity for that.